All right. So hello, everybody. Welcome back to our third installment with Avraham Gileadi here. We are reviewing the Isaiah verses in the Book of Mormon. And today we are going to be reviewing the block that's included in 2 Nephi 11 through 19, which is going to include chapters 2 through 9 of Isaiah. So that'll be the overlap there. And we're excited to dive in. This is the biggest quotation we have of Nephi's words, excuse me, of Isaiah's words here in 2 Nephi. It will go from chapter 2 all the way to 14. So uh, we're pretty eager to get into that. Avraham, maybe before we start, would you maybe, for those who uh, this might be new to, would you maybe give somewhat of an explanation or your impression on why Nephi would go through such great lengths to sort of rescribe and in gold plates, you know, portions of the book of Isaiah? Yeah, without really going into detail of explaining each verse or each concept or literary devices or anything like that, just handing it over verbatim like that, <clears throat> which shows that he's leaving it to those who read it, which is knowing that it's us today, right? And his descendants in our day, through having seen the end from the beginning, having seen into our day, so he knows the whole scenario of how it's going to come forth. And through the prophet Joseph Smith, and be made available. So he's really dumping it off on us to interpret Isaiah. Except that here and there he gives some keys for understanding it. The spirit of prophecy, which is the testimony of Jesus, in Second Nephi twenty-five, after he gets through all those chapters, and then the letter, the letter of prophecy, or the, the learning after the matter of the Jews, which is really quite profound, and is necess necessary to learn, but to understand Isaiah's prophecies. So, it kind of tells you that. And then later on, Jesus gives keys for understanding Isaiah also. It kind of tells you that the burden is on us. And so that we, he's expecting us to measure up, in other words, to, to, to tackle this material, very complex, very, the highest literature that there is probably in the world, because this is prophecy on so many layers and so many levels. And it requires diligent searching, as Jesus says, which he makes a commandment. And he could not tell his people those things because they were, like us, were at lower levels. So it's really up to individuals, always has been, to learn these things. But today, you and I, which we have already been doing in the first couple of instances of this, of this series, can, can actually parse or analyze some of these verses and provide some ideas, some keys for how the matter of the Jews works and what literary devices are necessary to understand in order to gain that deep understanding of Isaiah that is really necessary for us to to to, to walk to walk us through this end time. And I I personally believe that it's a deliberate challenge and those who don't take it on will suffer, perhaps suffer far worse than they might have imagined without understanding this. And I, we were just talking before we started conferencing here, Cameron, about living in a beautiful house with beautiful scenery, right? And after a while, after living in such a beautiful place, as I once did with my family, you get used to the scenery and the, and the terrain and everything, you get so used to it that it, you don't notice it anymore or appreciate it anymore. And it's like the scriptures to LDS people, well, to anybody, I, except I would say the Jews. They always treat scriptures with the utmost reverence. You get so used to it, you just pass over it without carefully scrutinizing it. And let's, let's hope that we can do some of that today to help people get less confused about what it's all about. Yeah, that's great. Absolutely. Thank you. I want to touch on one thing that you said, which is relative to the spirit of prophecy, right? Which we read in the book of Revelation is 
the testimony of Jesus. And Nephi offers that as a key to understanding Isaiah. And this is something that we kind of touched on briefly in the last video, and I think it's worth mentioning again, which is that the end times is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Like you said, Abraham, it's the revelation of his pattern, of his nature, of his character. And his physical coming to the earth is sort of the, the pinnacle or culmination of all of that. But the events that are that are laid out, the sequence of events, are reflective of him. As you come to understand Christ better, you'll have a greater insight into the book of Isaiah and into prophecy in general and into the end times and vice versa, right? Those things will kind of feed into each other. And, you know, Nephi sort of makes this point as well later on, but even before we get into Isaiah, as he's just kind of teeing up this large block of scripture here, he says, my soul delighteth in proving unto my people the truth of the coming of Christ. This is in chapter 11. For, for this end hath the law of Moses been given, and all things which have been given of God from the beginning of the world unto man are the typifying of him. And also my soul delighteth in the covenants of the Lord, which he hath made to our fathers. And so what we're going to kind of be getting into today is the fulfillment of these covenants, right? And that is all captured I think, in the end time revelation of Jesus Christ. Yes, I, I think as Latter-day Saints, we don't have that incredibly strong consciousness of the Lord's covenants, of God's covenants. The Sinai covenant, which is still current, just because people broke it in the past doesn't mean that it's still not relevant. All of God's covenants are permanent and they continue on through endless ages. The Davidic covenant that teaches you how to become a savior of others, the next step on the spiritual ladder, that of the elect of God, and of translated being, and of Christ himself. The Abrahamic covenant, which is a promise, like the Lord promised Lehi, basically the same as Abraham, a posterity as numerous as the sands of the sea and as the stars of heaven for multitude. In other words, Godhood, because that's the kind of posterity God has. Yes, it's all the Lord's revelations, all his voice, it's his persona. Scriptures embed that persona. That's why Jesus could say, he is the truth and the light. All the truth is manifest in him. The truth of all things is manifest in this person of Jehovah or Jesus Christ. And that's a beautiful thing. And it's not, it's simple, but it's not, it's also complex because there are so many layers of this truth, right? As God is many layered, and progression is layered, spiritual progression is layered, from one step to the next, descent, a descent phase and ascent phase, ruin and rebirth, humiliation and exaltation, the, some of the main themes of Isaiah are built around that concept. So yeah, it's so rich, but let's get into some of the nitty gritty, Cameron. Yeah. And see if we can just parse some of these scriptures and say, okay, after all, after all, after applying all these literary tools that we've had, we have been using, here, here are some of the things we're finding. And this may help you create interest for you in, in the words of Isaiah and how truly great they are. Truly great and profound. All right. Okay. That's it. Let's do it. Let's get into it. All right. So we'll kick it off here in chapter two, and we're just going to go through some select verses. Obviously, we don't have time to get into every single verse, but we'll, of course, maybe leave that to you if this is something that interests you. So learn so, more. And uh, yeah, and I would say in some of Abraham's books, IsaiahExplained.com is a great resource as well for some of these keywords and commentary. Abraham, are you going to say something? Yes. I think in this case, I might stop you during the reading to discuss something before we move to the next part of the chap of the passage, if that's okay with you. Yeah. So that we don't get, well, either way, but let's, let's try that. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, and just as a reminder, one last thing before we dive in here, like we talked about in the past, the context for the fulfillment of 
the prophecy in Isaiah, and the fulfillment of the covenants that the Lord's made to the house of Israel is the end times. This is the restoration of the natural branches back into the main olive tree, right? Yep. Yes. Um, that, is how, that is how Nephi and Jacob and Jesus, when they quote Isaiah, they're always quoting Isaiah, and they start speaking about the end time. And it's the time of the end, not the time of Joseph Smith, not some other time. It's historically Isaiah's time, but as in the living structures that I discovered over many years of research, they transformed the entire book of Isaiah into an end time scenario. So that goes along with what Jesus says is a key. All things he spoke, spoke have been in his, in his day, Isaiah's day, and shall be, that is, in the end time. And Nephi says in First, Second Nephi 25, people in the end time will understand them because in that day they will be fulfilled. And Isaiah himself talks about having to, being commanded to write a book about the end time. This is a vision about the end time. So to Isaiah, it's all one vision. And even the historical parts relate as types and shadows of something that happens in the end time. All right, let's go. Okay. So verses 1 through 3. A prophecy concerning Judea and Jerusalem, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw in vision. Okay. In latter days. Oh. So, right there. Judea and Jerusalem were in his day, right? Judea, or Judea is the province of the southern kingdom of Israel. The ten tribes have already gone captive into Assyria. And Jerusalem is the capital. So let's superimpose this upon the end time. And, and what do we have? Let's say Utah and Salt Lake City then these ancient names become code names for end-time entities, right? For end-time nations and people. Once you, once you latch onto that principle of that Isaiah speaks about things in the past and things of the end-time, then these names are not literal anymore belonging to a Judea and Jerusalem of today. No, they are talking about God's covenant people today, which are Latter-day Saints uh, who were living, you know, well, more beyond the Utah for it's going to be that ethnocentric, but but yes, let's just it's say a pattern, right? The identities yes. are defined by the kinds of people who fulfill them. Yes, and we can and take that and lift it, and yeah, and apply it to apply it to our day. All right. Yes. Okay. Okay. In the latter days, the mountain of Jehovah's house shall become established as the head of the mountains; it shall be preeminent among the hills and all nations will flow to it. Many people shall say, uh, excuse me, many people shall go, saying, come, let us go up the mountain of Jehovah, the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us in his ways, that we may follow in his paths. Okay. Which time frame is this speaking about? I've heard part of the common interpretations that's come down in the writing, in modern writings. It's kind of a little bit ridiculous because it's about the end time. In other words, it used to be, well, they're coming to the Rocky Mountains to here to go to conference and so forth. No, it's not. It's the context here is, is actually a war to end all wars. And we might say, rather say that it, when the New Jerusalem is established, this will apply. Not Salt Lake City, it could be a type for a while, you know, where the pioneers came and they heard the word of God, yes. But it's not the fulfillment of this prophecy. The, the real fulfillment is the end time fulfillment. And and the word mountains in, in Isaiah, through a series of parallel verses, synonymous parallel verses, the word mountains is a, is a metaphor for nations. And so when the Lord made a covenant with Israel, one of the blessings of the covenant was that Israel would become the head of the nations. So that makes sense here when in the millennial age, God's people in Zion will become the head of the nations as well of the world at that time. So that starts to make a whole lot more sense. And all nations will flow to it. And, you know, there are keywords or word links here to flow. And when you connected to flow somewhere else in Isaiah, you see that it's it's the it's the return out of Babylon in the new in the new wandering of wilderness, it's the gathering of Israel flowing to to Zion and to Jerusalem. 
a millennial Zionist tradition. So that is the context where the Lord will instruct us more fully in things pertaining to the higher parts of the gospel, as, as Jesus calls the true points of his, of his doctrine. Yeah. What it, anything else to add there, Cameron? I don't know that I have anything to add. I would say as we go on through the rest of this chapter, the context will become clear that this is talking about the millennial day. This isn't this isn't like a time period that's separate from that. So yeah, just to kind of add on Abraham's point, this is the nature of prophecy is such that you can you can take descriptions and find applications of them all over. But when it comes to the right, the the integrated whole that Isaiah is talking about here. It's a millennial context. So moving on here, uh, the remainder of verse 3 says, For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and from Jerusalem the word of Jehovah. He will judge between the nations and arbitrate for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift the sword against nation, nor will they learn warfare anymore. So this, of course, is speaking to an era in which there's going to be universal peace, right? As you said, Abraham, on the heels of a war to end all wars. Yes, so that's the context for that. Those first two verses, three verses. A millennial context. Okay, let's move on. So skipping down to verse 12. Jehovah of hosts has a day in store for all the proud and arrogant, for all who are exalted, that they may be brought low. It shall come against all the lofty cedars of Lebanon that lift themselves up high, and against all the oaks of Bashan, against all high mountains and elevated hills, against every tall tower and reinforced wall, against all vessels at sea, both merchant ships and pleasure craft. The haughtiness of men shall be abased, and man's pride brought low. Jehovah alone shall be exalted in that day. That is the day of reckoning. That's what we have a conference about this 30th of March, the Isaiah Institute. If you go to the website, you will, it's called the day of reckoning. And that's the day, the day the Lord has in store. Go ahead, Cameron. Some commentary there. Yeah, you know, this this phrase at the very end of verse 17 gets used as a refrain, I believe, a couple of times through the remainder of this chapter. Uh, the Lord alone or Jehovah alone shall be exalted at that day. And the idea that's being expressed there is there is there is a, a very real throwing down of all of our man-made inventions. And the reason that this era of peace be ushered in is because those who remained learned to put their trust in God above all else. You know, the, the primary problem before the end time destruction starts is idolatry right so what the lord what the lord does in this day of judgment is sort of a stripping away of of all of these idols anything that someone could find security in or put their trust in other than him will be stripped away so that uh mankind can learn perfect and pure faith in the lord and also the concept of those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted, which is a, kind of a central theme of I, two opposite themes of Isaiah. The central themes are humiliation and exaltation. On the one hand, Jesus subjects himself to be humiliated when he comes to earth in the meridian of time, but then he ends up exalted at his second coming and there you have his first his descent phase into suffering and humiliation, and then his ascent phase into exaltation and salvation. And that's, that's the pattern he establishes for those who wish to follow him. On the other hand, the king of Assyria, who is an Antichrist figure in the book of Isaiah, an end-time Antichrist figure, he does the opposite. He exalts himself now. And then he ends up totally humiliated in, in the bottomless, in the bottom of the pit of hell, uh, where, where they all mock him and look askance at him and so forth. So on the one hand, those who humble themselves now, you know, follow follow Christ, and those who are arrogant and proud now are the ones who are actually following 
the king of Assyria or that paradigm. That everything yeah. exalts us. Everything exalts us. Here it talks about. Yeah, go, go ahead and explain the cedars of Lebanon, oaks of Bashan, Cameron, would you? Yeah, you know, trees very frequently in the book of Isaiah are representative of people. So some of the descriptions here concerning these people we get from verse 13 say that they're you know lofty. These are the lofty cedars of Lebanon that lift themselves up high. To Abraham's point, these are those that exalt themselves. The cedars of Lebanon were typically representative of sort of the pillars of society in some sense. Yes. And so these are those that, yeah, they elevate themselves, right? It's a posture of pride. Yeah, people shout out, shout out down to them and consider them, you know, kind of like figures of authority. Well, they're just human, just like the rest of us, but people make idols of them. And I also hear mountains being a metaphor for nations. You know, one huge nations, powerful nations, and less powerful nations, elevated hills, they're all prideful. And every child reinforced wall. In other words, the whole institution of 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 the land is coming under censorship and other condemnation here. And it all happens in this day that the Lord has a store, just called the Day of Jehovah in the book of Isaiah, or the Day of the Lord. It's the Day of Judgment. But it has a positive side as well, because that's the very time that the righteous, those who humble themselves, are delivered. So this is just one side of the coin here that we're looking at. The other side of the coin is when when it gets that bad and it gets that difficult to live amidst all of this, upside down this, then that's the, when the Lord intervenes in humanity's affairs and sets things right and delivers his, his elect out of it and, and starts a whole new civilization with them, the millennial civilization. Yeah. Yeah. I, I put together a video a few weeks ago called Laban is Always Slain at the End of the World. It was kind of a fun take on on patterns we see at the end of the world, and it gets at this very idea that essentially what happens, what we see at the end is that there's always kind of this upside-down world that appears where the wicked are brought into the center or they're brought up high and the righteous are pushed to the edges and they're, you know, they're humbled, right? But there comes a there comes a certain key moment where the Lord, because He's just, says enough is enough, and He sort of snaps His fingers, and there's a reversal of circumstances, right, where everything is put back in its proper place. Yes, and that's what those who trust in the Lord and hope for Him to intervene. That's where they will end up. That reversal of circum their circumstances and their enemy circumstances happens. Nephi talks about it. It's all through the scriptures. It's a beautiful thing, but. The key or the trick is to hang on to the end. Maybe even what you think is past the point of endurance. And you have to be willing to keep the law of the last minute, right? <laughs> to hold out until Jesus actually comes, the Lord comes and intervenes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that phrase of yours that you used. And I think it, maybe just to take you know Nephi and Laban as an anecdote here, I think that's maybe a good illustration of that, right? Nephi is, is persecuted. Laban even attempts to kill him because of his authority and his position. And then he's beat by his brothers. But eventually the Lord does come along to empower him, right? So that, that things can be turned right back up. So, perfect. Okay, let's move on. So getting into chapter 3 here. Jerusalem will falter and Judea fall because their tongue and their actions are contrary to Jehovah. An affront to his glory before his very eyes. The look on their face betrays them. They flaunt their sin like Sodom. They cannot hide it. Woe to their souls. They have brought disaster upon themselves. Tell the righteous it shall be well with them. They shall eat the fruit of their own labors. Yeah, there you have that dichotomy. The, the wicked and the righteous. The righteous by the Lord's standard of righteousness, right? And, and you can tell one of the standards here is that that they are providing for themselves. They're, they've done preparation, so they have no fear what's coming, so long as they prepared enough to subsist on during the difficult time. And that's one of the attributes here of, of righteousness. Uh, because these two, ver these two lines of that 
births aren't parallel with each other, right? So that tells you something. Yeah, it, it's important to note here, of course, the way that Isaiah talks about various groups of people gets sort of grouped together under these different labels or identities. And one of those is, is Zion and Jerusalem, right? It's a category or a spiritual condition. And what we see typically is that it's it's those who have repented and received a remission of their sins, right? Or they're, they're typically covenant people of the Lord. So the fact that they're under condemnation here ought to tell us something as far as applying this to our own day goes, right? It means that that even those who are members of the church, let's say, are not immune from warnings, right, of wickedness and invitations to repent. So something that you've said, Abraham, that I really like is, you know, Isaiah and the message of the scriptures in general has bad news that has good news. And if we ignore the bad news, then you know, we kind of miss the point. But if we apply the bad news to ourselves first, then we can be recipients of the good news. Yes, and that actually is the substance of most of these chapters that Nephi is quoting, is the bad news. So it can seem like a lot of bloom and doom from Isaiah. But wait, you know, the the later chapters of Isaiah toward the last part of his book are the most glorious promises of the Lord that you'll ever find anywhere in Scripture. So, look at it in that perspective and don't take all this gloom and doom. But you absolutely will have to deal with the bad news and apply it to yourself and say, okay, am I leaning, am I leaning toward the sodomite you know, culture, subculture that's taking over us in our society that people are promoting and becoming very aggressive about that everybody should accept that? because that's the cool thing to do nowadays. I'm not going to stand for that. You know, is, is, can, can, can this apply to, you know, to the, to, to the headquarters of the church and to people who traditionally have been, you know, the devoted Latter-day Saints? Is the younger generation still holding to those principles of righteousness and truth? Or are they many falling away and so forth? Yeah, we don't have to, you know, rack, rack our souls with guilt. But if these things do, in fact, apply to us, we ought to repent of them. And we ought to recognize that and not just ignore or deny or deceive ourselves that that's not us. That can't be us. We're never the bad guys in any scenario. It's always the other guys. <clears throat> it's those Jews or, or, or the, the Lamanites or the, the, the Nephites in their wicked state. We could stay before there. No, this time around, it's very plain. These scriptures from Isaiah are intended to address. They address us, and they're intended for us to to confront and to cleanse ourselves of any of these kind of condemnations. That Nephi has seen a vision and wants us to know, because these are telling us things that he cannot tell us personally, because he was forbidden to do so. And his doing so anyway would be condemning of us. And they are not about to look down their noses at us. They want us to figure it out for ourselves. So there it is. We're given all the scriptures that we need to understand where we're at and what we need to do with these with these passages from Isaiah. I'm sorry we've only been able to talk about a few selections from these chapters because there's just not enough time in the day to... <laughs> go over them entirely. But you can at home. Yeah. Yeah. If you are interested, Avraham, I know, gives a very rich treatment to uh, all of these verses in depth in his books. So I highly recommend that. So verses 12 through 15. As for my people, babes subject them. Women wield authority over them. Oh, my people, your leaders mislead you, abolishing your traditional ways. Jehovah will take a stand and contend with them. He has arisen to judge the nations. He will bring to trial the elders of his people and their rulers and say to them, It is you who have devoured the vineyard. You fill your houses by depriving the needy. What do you mean by oppressing my people, humbling the faces of the poor, says Jehovah of hosts? It's kind of self-explanatory, isn't it? When you look at the political situation today, 
and what do you have? <laughs> you have, you know, they have very immature people who have a very surfacey concept of reality, if any, hardly, and they're and they're the ones in charge. In, in Washington D.C. or wherever, the political establishment seems so shallow anymore. And as for abolishing your traditional ways, you know, family values and and traditional ways of righteousness and and living by the true principles, they're being thrown under the bus. You know, there's an interesting point worth noting, and that is that the Lord says, my people here, right? A phrase that I think you coined, Abraham, is the covenant formula, right? My God, your people, or your God, my people. And, you know, the Lord's the Lord's reference here to this people in question as his people, right? He owns them, identifies for us who this is as well. Um, so if, if we were the ones claiming to be the Lord's covenant people, as Latter Day Saints, then the indictment is on us. And of course, you know we we read this in the Doctrine and Covenants, section one twelve says, "Upon my house it shall begin," meaning the last day's judgments, and from my house it shall go forth. First among those among you, saith the Lord, who professed it of my name, who have not known me, right, and have blasphemed against me in the midst of my house. So, where there's greater light, there's greater condemnation as well. And uh, I think that's what we're reading here. So there again, you see that the time of judgment is coming. He has arisen to judge the nations. At a certain point, the Lord stands up and confronts humanity. But first of all, confronts his own people because they always traditionally, in all the scriptures, in all scriptural patterns, it is when his own covenant people lose the idea of who they are become worldly and like other nations, other peoples, then that is when the Lord brings on not just a judgment of his own people, but of the larger nation or the larger world or the larger area where it involves other nations as well. That happened with the Assyrians when the ten tribes apostatized, the Assyrians rose to world power and took them captive and destroyed many of them. Then a century and a half later when Babylon became a world power. It was on the heels of the southern kingdom of Judea, of Judah, you know, rebelling against God. And But we need to say, okay, what are we doing that can bring this on? Because that's the pattern. This, this judgment of, of the entire world will not happen until the Lord's own people have forfeited their birthright. Not all of them necessarily, because there will be some who will restore the house of Israel, the Jewish ten tribes and Lamanites, and graft in these natural branches back into the olive tree. But on the whole, it'll be because the main body of God's covenant people today, or well, Latter-day Saints, will have gone the way of the world. And only some will remain to, to carry the gospel back to the house of Israel. The same thing happened in, you know, in reverse in Jesus' day, when they rejected Christ as a nation and the gospel went to, to, to the Gentiles. Now, this time it's going to reverse itself. That way. You know, and I think the reason that Nephi is quoting all of these chapters about the judgment of the Lord's end time covenant Gentile people is because this is the context in which the covenants that he has made to the house of Israel will be fulfilled, right? And so he's sort of setting the stage here and saying, these are the markers, right? Uh, take take note of these things. We read in 3 Nephi 16 that it's it's when the Gentiles reject the fullness of the gospel. It says they'll become a salt that's lost its savor. And that's a covenant curse. To be the salt of the earth is that's a covenant blessing and a covenant status. We read in section 103 of the Doctrine and Covenants that we're given to be a saviors of men, right? That's that's the birthright Abraham is referring to. But if we don't, then we'll become a salt that's lost its savor. And it's in the context of the fulfillment of that covenant curse that we then read in various parts of the scriptures. Then the Lord turns his heart to the Lamanites, to the Jews, to the 
lost 10 tribes. Right. It's, it's the Ephraimite Gentiles as a whole who reject the gospel after they, sometime after they received it. And they received it through the prophets. Prophet Joseph Smith and it was restored upon the earth. But there is that, that faction or that group of, of Ephraimite Gentiles who will fulfill their birthright obligations and craft in the natural branches of the house of Israel, as it's spoken of in, in Zenus's allegory, the Olive Tree in Jacob 5. And so hopefully, you know, if enough of us latch on to the prophecy of Isaiah and become familiar with our covenantal obligations as Latter-day Saints to gather Israel, meaning beyond just doing missionary work, but restoring the house of Israel and carrying them in our arms and upon our shoulders in the new exodus out of Babylon <clears throat> through the wilderness, wilderness wandering to lands of inheritance in the old in the old Jerusalem and in the new Jerusalem. Then then that will happen. And when Zion is established among them, <clears throat> then the Lord can indeed come. All right, so moving on to chapter 4 of Isaiah and chapter 14 in 2 Nephi. We'll read verses 2 through 6 here. In that day, the plant of Jehovah shall be beautiful and glorious, and the earth's fruit, the pride and glory of the survivors of Israel. Then shall they who are left in Zion, and they who remain in Jerusalem, be called holy. All who are inscribed to be among the living at Jerusalem. This shall be when the Lord has washed away the excrement of the women of Zion and cleansed to Jerusalem of its bloodshed in the spirit of justice, by a burning wind. Over the whole site of Mount Zion and over its solemn assembly, Jehovah will form a cloud by day and a mist glowing with fire by night. Above all that is glorious shall be a canopy. It shall be a shelter and shade from the heat of the day, a secret refuge from the downpour and from rain. So I think here we're just getting the description of of kind of what we've been talking about, the plant, right? And I think in the in the KJV and the Book of Mormon, this word gets translated as the branch, right? But the plant of Jehovah shall be beautiful and glorious. This is reference to a few things, I think, on a few different levels. This, of course, is a suited in for the end time servant. I think the context in which Nephi is using this, another application would be his own people, right? Nephi's own people, the as a, as a branch from the house of Israel that has been grafted out and is now being grafted back in, right? And has referenced all of these righteous branches that are being rejoined to the house of Israel. Yes, according to the concept of the one and the many, the one represents the many, yes, indeed. So yes, and the earth's fruit, the, like the earth's first fruits are the pride and glory of the survivors of Israel. So they're going to be survivors of this judgment, right? This worldwide judgment, a war to end all wars upon the earth, after which the millennial age begins. And then they who are left in Zion, those whom the Lord protected, whom he delivered through the great destructions, they, and they who remain in Jerusalem be called holy or sanctified, or the elect of God, in other words, just men or women made perfect, all who described in the Book of Life <clears throat> to be among the living at Jerusalem. Yeah, you know, I, I really like that. Something in verse 3 here stands out to me on that. There's a there's a phrase in the Book of Revelation that gets used over and over again at the beginning a handful of times, and that is, to him that overcometh, and then the Lord fills in the blank with, with a blessing or, or some kind of condition. And I, I see this phrase sort of being used in the same way, right? That is, he that overcomes trials and tribulations, the opposition that comes, he that remains in Jerusalem through the tribulation, he who, you know, like Job, holds fast to his faith in the Lord, will be called holy. In First Nephi 14, we read that the power of the Lord will be poured down on the saints, right, at the time of their persecution when the great and abominable church starts to make war with them. And saints and, and holy ones, right? It's, that's the same word in Hebrew. So there's something about the trial and opposition that we're at any time called to go through and that 
those in the end times are described as going through that refines us and, and makes us pure and holy. Right, and the reference to the excrement of the women of Zion is from chapter 3, which talks about the women and all their trappings to make themselves beautiful, be seen of men, and so forth. <clears throat> uh, Isaiah describes as so much excrement. Well, God describes it as so much excrement. And then, of course, the men are guilty, for the most part, of bloodshed, as well as women, of course, with abortions and so forth. In the spirit of justice by burning wind, you notice some of these words here are highlighted because they represent individuals as well, secondarily, or sometimes that's their primary meaning even. The king of Assyria, he personifies the burning wind. He is the wind. He also personifies the fire and the heat of, of the day, of the day of judgment. He's the one that launches this great end-time destruction, the fire and the sword. In the in, in God's in the day of Jehovah, and He's also the downpour of you know nuclear war. Or what, it's called the hail in Isaiah. A secret refuge from the downpour from rain. These are metaphors for you know for weapons also that are used. And the Lord provides for those who go out in the Exodus and water in the wilderness. He provides as he did in the Sinai wilderness, a cloud of glory, a cloud by day and of fire by night, over the whole assembly of these people as they wander through the wilderness to Zion as a protection. In fact, they can't be seen from the outside. And there's justification for bleeding from many who have seen these things in visions, and so forth, that they actually go into a different time zone. Uh, where they cannot be seen from the outside of that time zone. I would just touch on again, you know, sometimes we'll see a set of uh, keywords or attributes that get applied to, you know, both the wicked and the righteous uh, because they, they sort of serve different different functions, right? So God has two hands, the right hand and the left hand. Um, fire is another one of these that, as dual application, right? The context in which it's being used here, a cloud by day and uh, mist glowing with fire by night, of course, is reference to the Lord Jehovah himself and his glory. But there's there's an opposing fire as well, right? And that's the fire of cleansing that the Lord uses as a force of judgment, which is the, the end time king of Assyria. Yes, I'm glad you pointed that out, Kevin, because I was just expressing it as, as a generality that these terms of personifications of people, yes, they're also personifications of the servant, on the other hand, of God's end-time servant, and of Jehovah himself, correct? So this definitely is is the friendly fire, not the unfriendly one. <laughs> the friendly fire. <laughs> okay. So moving into chapter 5 here and Second Nephi 15. They have despised the law of Jehovah of hosts and reviled the words of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, the anger of Jehovah is kindled against his people. He draws back his hand against them and strikes them. The mountains quake, and their corpses lie like litter about the streets. Yet for all this, his anger is not abated. His hand is upraised still. You know, a, a thought I have, of course, what we're reading here is a description of the Lord's judgment on, clearly it says, his people, Right? A thought I had as I was reading through this is there's a sense in which both the righteous and the wicked suffer this, but they have different effects. As the righteous go through this, they they will surrender this as an opportunity to the Lord to grow in faith and to be refined, which is what empowers them to ultimately fulfill their end-time ministry. The wicked, on the other hand, are, are going to allow this to embitter them. Right. These are these are the judgments that they rightfully deserve. Yes, and and, and the, you can see there the root of it all is despising the law of the Lord of hosts and reviling the words of the Holy One of Israel. And those words, of course, come in different forms. They come primarily in the scriptures, especially that relate to the end time, like the words of Isaiah do. They come through the prophets of the Lord, and they come through the, the end-time servant who is sent 
as the Lord's voice and as his mouth or mouthpiece. Those terms also are metaphors or aliases of a servant. And here we have other metaphors and aliases that typify, typify the king of Assyria. The Lord is not an angry God, but the king of Assyria is very angry. He's kind of like Hitler or some of the great tyrants of the world. He personifies God's anger, and the Lord uses him as an instrument to punish the wicked of his people, primarily against his people. It says it against his people. That he's also the Lord's left hand of punishment with which the Lord smites them. And again, we have to say and remind us this is about us. This is how it's going to come out against us. That it is saints, an end time prophecy about God's people, which we today are. And not with the finger at anybody else in the past or against somebody else today. It's primarily against us whom he's addressing here. And Nephi knows that, and he's he's saying it anyway. He's using Isaiah to say what he can't verbalize against us directly. The mountains or the nations quake. In chapter 14, it talks about the nations quaking. So the word quake is a word link to chapter 14. And mountains, we know from a couple of instances, Isaiah is a synonymous is synonymous with nations, kingdoms. So, at any rate, mountains don't have corpses, but nations do. They lie like litter about the streets, which is a covenant curse. Yet for all this, the king of Assyria is not abated. His anger is still there, just like Hitler. And the Lord's hand is still upraised, his hand of punishment, because the Lord wills it. He wants to do a thorough job of his day of judgment which only the righteous of his people will survive. Just as happened when the Lord came to the, to the Nephites in the Book of Mormon, right? His coming, to the, in the, as President Benson said, to the Nephites is a type and shadow of his second coming when he comes out of the sky and appears to his people. But that event was preceded by the most immense destruction that had ever happened on this continent. And so it is in the end time. There's the most immense destruction the world has ever seen that is part, as you, you know, and parcel of the day of judgment. It's twofold, just as Israel's coming out of Egypt was twofold. The Egyptians were slain and the Israelites escaped through the Red Sea. The two halves of the same coin. And that's how we should regard this day of judgment. And not that the gloom and doom aspect of it you know, overpower us over emotionally so we can't handle it. The other half of the coin is there's deliverance right there at the very time that these judgments are happening. Hmm. You know, that reminds me of the verse in Third Nephi 9. This is right after the destructions among the Nephites where they hear a voice. It's the Lord's voice. He says, Oh, all ye that are spared because you were more righteous than they, Will ye not now return unto me and repent of your sins and be converted that I may heal you? Right? So the there are different ways to handle, I think, judgment and opposition when it's when it is poured out. And turning to the Lord and, and offering it up as a free will offering to him is one sure way to allow it to purify us and sanctify us. Yes, we can get caught up in the collective guilt and collective punishment of the nation, of the people as a whole. But the Lord makes provision for a way of escape for us individually who are who adhere to the Lord and desire to do nothing but his will and trust in him to deliver us. And, and he will. He's bound by he's bound by the terms of our covenants to do so when we do our part. Correct? Mm. Well said. All right, moving on. Verses twenty six through twenty eight. He raises an ensign to distant nations and summons them from beyond the horizon. For with they come swiftly and speedily. Not one of them grows weary, nor does any stumble. They do not drowse or fall asleep. Their waist belts come not loose, nor their sandal thongs undone. Their arrows are sharp, all their bows are strung. The tread of their war horses resembles flint. Their chariot wheels revolve like a whirlwind. So this is an instance where this this keyword ensign 
we have read, of course, in other places, this refers to the Lord's right hand where, you know, the, the righteous are gathered. This enzyme is the Lord's left hand, right? It, it's a, it's sort of an unholy or an unrighteous gathering of the wicked who are, who are gathered together, right, to, to bring about the Lord's judgments. So the alliance of nations that come against the Lord's people in the end time. Yes. And the king of Assyria is that ensign in this case. Again, we have to put away our presumptuousness about thinking that we know what this means. The word links and all of the literary devices in Isaiah tell us what they mean. The word raises, the word ensign, and this whole scenario, you know, one of the most almost tragic but also humorous applications of this passage was once applied I don't know if it still is, to the missionary force that goes out. And they don't they don't stumble, they don't go weary, they're, they're converting people, they're very disciplined. That's not the context at all. <laughs> Sorry about this. Kelly did this. Funny. This is an end time scenario of the King of Assyria's army out of an alliance of nations, as anciently the King of Assyria had an alliance of nations. So the end time King of Assyria you know, and not, not nothing to do with Mesopotamia anymore. This is the great world power from the north, a militaristic power, like Russia and its alliance, let's say. Let's, let's, let's just put that out there. I'm not saying that it is, but it's something like that. Um, and he summons those nations and those powers. They align themselves with the wrong side, and they come swiftly and speedily. Okay, and then there was... I guess you know this, Cam, and you probably were going to speak about it. It's these terms, growing weary, stumbling, falling asleep, and drowsing, waist belts loose, saddles always undone. There are descriptions of the Lord's people where these are word links to the Lord's people showing them to be weary and stumbling and drowsing and falling asleep, waist belts coming loose and saddles always undone. So this is a contrast to the Lord's people, not the Lord's people, or their mission for us, was something ridiculous like that. Hmm. Yeah, so, yeah. Well said. It's interesting. It's interesting that the Lord is using a force of people who do not falter in a way that His own people do. Well, they used to not. <laughs> there were times where they did not, right? Um, but. Yeah, he brings upon them this huge military force. Like the Assyrians were the first to conquer the ancient world by military force. And, you know, chariot wheels, think of tanks and and you know, modern you know modern you know, military assets. See, where these things are you know, that arrows could be missiles and so forth. Yeah, just put it in the modern context and you can see that these things are symbolic of things today. Okay? Okay. Let's keep going. All right, verses 29 and 30. They have the roar of a lion. They are aroused like young lions. Growling, they seize the prey and escape, and none comes to the rescue. He shall be stirred up against them in that day, even as the sea is stirred up. And should one look to the land, there too shall be distressing gloom, for the daylight shall be darkened by an overhanging mist. I, I can't help but read that last line and think of this upcoming eclipse in April here. You know, I've heard in Native American cultures, eclipses were seen as symbols of divine judgment, right? Of course, some of the ways that you can read this involve darkness, right? Being the Lord's, the Lord's hand of judgment or this king of Assyria sort of overshadowing the light for a period of time in which judgment is wrought. So, I don't know. Avram, you have anything to maybe comment on? See, the word lion there is, represents the king of Assyria also. He's, but that term in itself, you know, a lion is not a human. It, it, it kind of harks to the idea where Isaiah uses people who are spiritually decreated, who are less than human. He starts calling them by the names of animals. And he growls and, and seizes the prey and escapes. They become less than humans. 
there his armies are aroused like young lions and he's like the sea in commotion or the river in flood he's called directly the king king of Assyria is, is called the river in chapters 7 and 8 of Isaiah which we don't have time to look into today and sea and river are ancient Near Eastern myth mythological powers of chaos and so Isaiah is using those terms sea and river as names or pseudonyms or aliases for the king of Assyria here, the end time king of Assyria. And the word stirred up is, occurs again in chapter 37 where it talks about the king of Assyria being stirred up against God and his people. There are so many world links here through to other parts of the book of Isaiah so you can't understand Isaiah by just you know, try to interpret a single verse. If you, you really have to learn the whole book of Isaiah as a as a whole entity, holistically, before you can start putting your own interpretation, putting your interpretations on anything, because it doesn't work that way, you know. And then the last part here: the daylight shall be darkened by no. Yeah, it's the distressing gloom or the gloom and doom scenario for the wicked. Is it will indeed be a gloom and doom. There'll be no deliverance out of it. That's their end. That's their end. Their end, the end of their existence on this earth. I'll have to go somewhere else. All the celestial people and worse will have to go somewhere else. They don't survive the end time destruction. Only ten percent of the earth's population at all, chapter six of Isaiah, survives the earth's cleansing, and only one percent of that would qualify as God's elect the tithe of the tithe of the earth's population. Yeah, so a lot of stuff's going on in that day. That's the day of judgment. Yeah, let's let's move on so we can okay. see what to do. So this is Isaiah chapter 9 and 2 Nephi 19. We'll read verses 2 and 3. The people walking in darkness have seen a bright light. On the inhabitants of the land, the shadow of death has the light dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice at your presence as men rejoiced at harvest time or as men are joyous when they divide the spoil. So, of course, we're getting some of these pseudonyms here that are going to have reference to certain significant players, right? Darkness is likened to, as you might guess, the king of Assyria and his force and everything that he represents. And then this bright light here is a reference to the Lord's servant, the righteous. So those walking in darkness, right? Those under the influence and captivity of the forces of darkness have seen a bright light, right? On the inhabitants of the land of the shadow of death has the light dawned. So this is the place in which we start to talk about and think about deliverance, right? From judgment, salvation from the wicked. And it's, it's by medium of the Lord's servant here. This reference here to, you know, enlarging the nation, increasing its joy, this is because of the light, right? The nation's been enlarged, meaning some of the imagery we get in Zenus's allegory might apply. It, this is the gathering back in of all of the, the branches back into Israel. So it, the nation's being enlarged by that gathering. It's like you said here at the beginning, Avraham, in chapter two, all nations will flow to uh, the mountain of the Lord's house. So the nation is enlarged, its joy increases, they rejoice at the Lord's presence because they've been prepared for it, right? Because the light has prepared them for it. Yeah, and you have to understand that at the end of the great destruction, the end of the war to end all wars, when there's all this spoil lying around, right? Because these armies, one of their main objectives is to despoil the people. And not they want to get rich and they want, when they go into war and they capture people and nations, they rifle the houses and steal their jewelry or whatever treasure they have. And so when they, when they, let, they themselves perish, so when the Lord intervenes, strengthens his people, and they, they fight back in the strength of the Lord, as instances in the Book of Mormon we have, then all that spoil is lying around that the Lord's people end up with 
for the millennial age, plus other treasures of the earth come out of the earth at that time. But yeah, indeed, the king of Assyria personifies darkness, and those who are part of his entourage, the nations and those who follow him as an exemplar in some way, or follow his patterns of the principles or non-principles, they're all forces of darkness, forces of chaos in the world. But in chapter 42 and 49, the Lord specifically appoints his servant to be a light to the Gentiles. So we can't ignore that once the Lord does that, once Isaiah does that, that term light applied to the Lord's servant specifically then has to be seen that way throughout the book of Isaiah. There's not, you know, a lot of light here, like Christmas light. No, it doesn't happen that way. There's this person called a light. And there's also a person who personifies darkness. And so we have to apply that light in this context, that once the servant comes along, whom he, the Lord appoints as a light to the Gentiles, to the Ephraimite Gentiles, because they've been wandering around in darkness, then things change. That's the Lord intervening in the affairs of his end time people to change things around. He, he, he can't suffer that they continue to walk in the dark and have lost the light of the gospel, have lost the light of faithfulness to God, have, have not connected with God in the prayers, in their prayers, they have not had experiences with the Lord, manifestations of him. Like the people who are not holding on to the iron rod, right? The tree of life. They're not getting to the tree of life. But it happens in the land of the shadow of death. Because death is a term with which the leaders of Ephraim have made a covenant. They've made a covenant with death. So this links to chapter 28 as well. Upon them has the light dawned. So when the Lord raises up his servant, that's the dawning of the light. Now the Lord himself is also a light, a greater light. It's, it's like the, the dawning of the, uh, the new day dawns before the sun comes up. The world gets lighter and lighter. And then at a certain moment, the sun pokes through the horizon. And that's the greater light. It's symbolic of the greater light of the Lord's second coming. Well, these events of the first, the dawning of the light, of the coming of the servant, is the prelude to what follows in this passage. That's really important to understand because it's laying the foundation for what follows that has been mistranslated by the world horribly and have caused them, as a precept of men and people have lived by for centuries now. But let's, fit, let's read verse 3, that those who see the light and gravitate to the light, they will be the ones to survive the world's destruction, the day of judgment. They will be the ones to rejoice as of harvest time when they divide the spoil. And they're happy because they've survived the time of destruction, the world judgment. They're overjoyed, just like when a war ends. Hey, we're still alive. We're the lucky ones that sort of have survived, you know. They're happy because God saved us. All right. Anything else to add to that, Cameron? I would just add here, you know, we talked a bit about at the beginning that all truth is contained in Christ. And I think one way to think about some of these attributes that we see applied to servants, to these servants and to groups of servants, is that Christ is inviting us into his order. He's inviting us to be like him. We read in the lectures on faith, he's the prototype of a saved being. We know, of course, in John 8, he says, I am the light of the world. And in Matthew 5, speaking to the house of Israel, he says, you're the light of the world, right? It's, it's not supposed to just stop at him. Everybody who follows him is intended to embody that same light and that same order and the same pattern. So here we have an example of that, right? In this servant, one who comes to embody light. And, and the thing about light is it spreads, right? It makes that which is around it more light. So there's a really this, And the servant, first of all, comes to the Ephraimite Gentiles. Uh, that has to be understood in that context. He doesn't come to all the house of Israel at, at once. His job, at first of all, is to gather enough Ephraimite Gentiles into, into his army or into his workforce because in, in Jacob's in Jacob 5, Zenus' allegory of the olive tree 
But what it tells his entire servant there, go and gather other servants to do the grafting in, to cut out the bad branches of the olive tree, where the whole, all the olive trees have gone bad by that time. And so the judgment counts. And these servants help him graft in the branches until the trees all bear fruit again. And that's the millennial, happens in the millennial age. So yes. There's a, there's a verse here in DNC 45 that speaks to this. It says, when the time of the Gentiles is come in or come to a close, a light shall break forth among them that sit in darkness, and it shall be the fullness of my gospel. But they receive it not, for they perceive not the light, and they turn their hearts from me because of the precepts of men. And in that generation shall the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there shall be men standing in that generation that shall not pass until they shall see an overflowing scourge, for a desolating sickness shall cover the land. But my disciples shall stand in holy places and be not moved. Yes, so, this is beautiful. Yeah, the, the light is the terms of the covenant as well as those who embody it, those who live it. Well, that's, that's in Isaiah. The servant comes to restore the true points of his doctrine, the Lord's doctrine. So he, he personifies the light just as Jesus personifies the truth. And he personifies the greater light. He personifies the law and the word of God. So us individuals can also personify these things to the degree that we pers that we assimilate them into our spiritual spiritual lives, into our psyche, and start living those things. Then we can personify light. We can all become lights. But in Isaiah's end time context, in this context, it is the servant himself who is the light. And then people will say, "Well, this, you know, the Lord is the light." The servant as a light to the Gentiles is Christ. No, it's not. Jesus is never sent to the Gentiles. He's very specific about whom he is sent to. He is sent to the house of Israel. He says in the New Testament, I am not sent but to the house of Israel. And so we have to draw that distinction and not assign things to Jesus. You know, see these scriptures and put our own spill on them. There, there are checks and balances that tell you who the light is all the way through. And until you have searched Isaiah sufficient to know those things, those how these literary devices work, you cannot just arbitrarily say those kinds of things. So that's a caution I want to give here before we move on to the next part of this passage, which is the one that a lot of people misinterpret. Okay. We'll read that now. Okay, so one more verse here before we get to that. Verses 4 and 5. You have smashed the yoke that burdened them, the staff of submission, the rod of those who subjected them, as in the day of Midian. And all boots used in battle and tunics rolled in blood have become fuel for bonfires. So this is reference to the servant's work of delivering, right, the righteous from captivity, uh, smashing the yoke, which is a reference to the king of Assyria, the staff of submission, the rod that subjected them, right, which represents his, his political rule over them. The day of Midian has reference to the triumph of Gideon over the Canaanites and Amalekites. So he's a type as well of, of the Lord's end time victory over the wicked. Gideon is the type of the servant as well, as are many Old Testament characters, such as Joshua. We led the conquest of the, of the promised land. That happens. That happens again in the end time. But yes, the coming of the light or the servant, and, and the Lord's empowering of him, he's the David who kills the Goliaths. Goliath being the type of the king of Assyria here, and his name indeed is David. <clears throat> the servant's name is David. Is also the prophet Jesus. Joseph Smith recognizes in page three thirty. 339 of the teacher of the prophet Joseph Smith. So he's the one that overthrows the king of Assyria eventually and his armies. And as in the day of Midian, when a disproportionately huge army you know, fought against Israel and the Lord empowered Gideon to overthrow them. Uh, they all followed Gideon. And yeah. And then, as, as I mentioned earlier, all boots use the battle to have become fuel for bonfires because this is the war to end all wars. There's got, got to be no more war. 
in the millennial age, maybe at the end, but that's not the end time scenario here. So, yeah, that's these things are setting up. This is you know the context for for the verse we're going to study now. Okay. All right, verses six and seven. For to us a child is born, a son appointed, who will shoulder the burden of government. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, One Mighty in Valor, a Father Forever, a Prince of Peace. That sovereignty may be extended and peace have no end. That on the throne of David and over his kingdom, his rule may be established and upheld by justice and righteousness from this time forth and forever. The zeal of Jehovah of hosts will accomplish it. Yeah, there you have it. It's the substance of uh, Handel's Messiah. <laughs> <laughs> and it has inspired many people down the centuries. But as one professor at BYU years ago pointed out, which which was already obvious to me before that, the word son is a word link. The word appoint is a word link to the Lord's servant later on in the book of Isaiah, and this passage is part of a section of Isaiah, of Isaiah's seven parts scripture that parallels directly a block of chapters later on in the book of Isaiah. So you cannot isolate it out of that structure and just start saying what Handel does with it. Besides the fact that that it doesn't say in Hebrew, it doesn't translate correctly in the King James Version. There are four couplets in Hebrew, as I was pointed out by a scholar, an Israeli scholar from the Hebrew University. There are four couplets here. Pele Yoetz, El Gibor, Avi Ad, and Sar Shalom. Uh, wonderful counselor, one mighty in valor. It doesn't say God necessarily, it's a mighty one who's valiant, a father forever indeed, and a prince of peace. And these four couplets, actually, you can take them to the book of Abraham and see them there, where Abraham desires to be a father of many nations, a prince of peace, and to, and to obtain the priesthood after the holy order of God, which Melchizedek, his ancestor, had. And you can also see it in the book of Genesis. There are some consecutive chapters where Abraham um, shows himself to be a wonderful counselor with when when they came to the promised land, he allowed Lot to choose which part of the promised land he wanted to live in. And Lot looked upon the plain that was fertile and green, and he chose that for himself instead of giving it to Abraham, allowing Abraham to to have it. And Abraham got the hills, the hill country. And of course, later on, Lot's selfishness didn't pay off because he had to get out of there when Sodom was destroyed. And then Abraham was one, was mighty in valor when his his little coalition defeated several you know northern kings who had robbed the people of the plain, and he won back their spoils and so forth. He became a father of many nations when the Lord made him that, and a prince of peace, which has a particular covenantal nuance, as a, a proxy savior of others, as he was for Lot, when they, when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It says. The Lord remembered Abraham and took Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. In other words, he was a proxy savior to Lot. And that's how Lot got to get out. Lot himself was a proxy savior for his daughters, or could have been for his wife too, if she had kept his law, but she did not. So there are all these, this, there's all these theology and word links and, and parallel scriptures that are out there that make this something entirely different than what has been assigned to it in the past. And you'll also notice that no scriptorian, no no evangelist, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or even Book of Mormon prophets, ever applied this passage to Jesus. They simply don't. They leave it alone because they know it's not about Jesus. It's an end-time scenario, again, going back to that context of Isaiah, that is an end-time context. After it after a war to end all wars in that context, referring to the light that was the subject set up 
at the beginning of this passage that the rest of this applies to. Yeah, and there it is also. His, his name is called Righteousness in chapter, what is it, 41, verse 2? He's called Righteousness. It's a person from the East who's named Righteousness because he personifies righteousness. It's one of his names. Yes, it also means righteousness in general by the Lord's definition, but it's also the person called righteousness. And the Lord sends him to establish justice upon the earth when there is no justice. Those are the, the Lord makes that very clear in chapter 42, which starts talking about the servant there. And the words servant and son are technical terms that pertain to a vassal relationship and also a, a proxy savior relationship under the terms of the Davidic covenant, which applies here. So, tell me, I've been talking a long time, Cameron. Huh. Tell me what I've missed. But <laughs> Give me your insights as well. I was just going to say, this is the order of righteousness. This is the description of someone with whom the Lord covenants, makes an everlasting covenant like he did to Abraham. Abraham becomes a father of many nations, right? And like we talked about earlier today and, and last week, the kind of posterity he has is an eternal posterity. Exaltation is nuanced in that description. But fatherhood is, is a covenant blessing. To be a prince of peace, to be a priest after the order of the Most High God. So, so Melchizedek was called a, pre, excuse me, a prince of a peace. A prince of peace as well, yeah. Alma 13, yes. Yeah, and I believe that's also in the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 14. I mean, he, he quite literally was the the prince of the king of Shalom, which was peace, or Salem. So, yeah, this is, this is certainly a, descrip excuse me, a description of um, servants of the Lord, right? And again, you know, those that are assimilated into his image, into the image of Christ, are going to, I think, reflect uh, similar attributes. So, it's not to say, right, that that I think these things don't apply to him in any way. All good derives from Christ, from God. Um, and to the extent that we're like him, we're going to display these kinds of attributes. Yes, those are messianic attributes. They apply to anybody. They apply to Christ, of course. All messianic attributes, you know, gel in Christ. They center in Christ and and, and our messianic or anybody else's messianic attributes only stem from those of, of Christ and, and, and their power is drawn from the, those of Christ or Jehovah. And yeah, historically, this passage was actually the celebration of King Hezekiah's installment or affirmation as a king, as a righteous king like Melchizedek. Keith Maservi, a professor at the BYU religion department, spoke about this very thing that, I'm, that I've been talking about here years ago. And he gave a presentation on that, that this is not referring to Christ, that this is referring to one in the end time. Or, or actually, he, he made it about to be Hezekiah, which, of course, who is the type of the servant of the, of the end time, correct? Correction. And so when Jerusalem was besieged, you know, and by an Assyrian army of 185,000 men. And Hezekiah himself kept God's law, and his people kept the king's law. Instead of going over to the Assyrians, who were threatening him with death, they held out faithful and loyal to their king, and so God was bound under the terms of the Davidic covenant to rescue them, to deliver them. And the angel of the Lord in one night slew the entire Syrian army of 185,000 men. And that is the slaughter that was, and the spoil of war that was left. That is how this covenant of the Davidic covenant works. It's a covenant of temporal deliverance, of physical protection, that the, that the heirs of David, who, who covenant with the Lord under the terms of the Davidic covenant, you and I can do it. Any head of a family can do it. All the 144,000 will be Davidic kings in that sense. We'll do that. And and also, as I wrote, wrote about the other day, the what defines a man in the book of Isaiah is one who intervenes or intercedes 
with, with God on behalf of others. And that is what the servant does, and all those who emulate Christ do, not for their spiritual salvation, as only Christ can do, but for their temporal salvation. And these people here are celebrating, celebrating their king, because he's a wonderful counselor, of the mighty and valor of our, a prince of peace. He's now gained those blessings on the Davidic covenant because he was loyal to the Lord under really extenuating circumstances. And his people were loyal to the king under these same extenuating circumstances. And then when the other little ones were all threatened with death by this arch tyrant, king of Assyria. And so this thing, the situation repeats itself in the end time. When the servant comes to the fore, there will be similar situation of an Assyrian siege of, of the New Jerusalem or, or stakes of Zion or the old Jerusalem, some kind of scenario where this repeats itself, where this is repeated and this scenario happens all over again and, and on a much grander scale than it did in the past. You know, in the book of Revelation, we read that to him that overcometh, where he says, I will grant with me to sit in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. So there's a sense in which this this Davidic throne is something that is not just limited uh, to one individual, right? But this is, to Abraham's point earlier, you know, on the principle of the one of the many, this is the very pattern of 144,000. That to those that overcome the persecution that follow in this same pattern of submission to God, uh, being humbled, right? Humiliation and, and holding out faithful to him that they will be empowered and exalted and given a rod to rule and in a throne so that they can, right? Be empowered to function as servants, to serve as servants to those in God's family. Yes, they can all become appointed sons in that sense, a son appointed. And, you know, when King A sided with the king of Assyria as his emperor rather than with Jehovah, he sent a message to the king of Assyria saying, I am your servant and your son. Come and deliver me from these from the king of Assyri from the king of, of the northern kingdom of Israel and from the king of Syria, not Assyria. He sent a message to the king of Assyria, say, I'm your servant and your son, because those were technical terms that defined a vassal king to an emperor. And in the Hebrew theology of the prophets, Moses and the prophets adopted that ancient and recent paradigm of emperors and their vassal kings, where vassal kings were called the servants or the son of an emperor. Now, Jehovah became the emperor. He was called the Lord or the father of the vassal, of any vassal of his empire. And so, first they had a servant-lord relationship, which was servile. This, depending on the conditions of the covenant, if the if the vassal proved loyal to the emperor and kept his law, then the emperor was bound to protect him from the threat of death from some direction from another emperor or whatever. But when the the vassal king proved loyal to the emperor under all conditions, enough trials that the emperor understood that this vassal was loyal to him forever, so to speak. Then he gave him a handshake and a new name, and he became the adopted son of the emperor. And the emperor was then called his father. But the vassal king himself was not just a son of the emperor, but he was a father to his own people, and they became his sons. And that's why you see in in Chronicles, how King Hezekiah makes a covenant with his people and calls them sons, whereas Hezekiah himself was a son of Jehovah, as celebrated here after he passes the test, proving loyal to God. Now, all of this whole theology and all of these prophecies, they all have to be seen together in one grand construct. And you cannot just run with one verse and put your spin on it you end up with all these precepts of men that have been around for centuries and they have not been understood because traditional Christianity took away the covenants of the Lord with his people as well. And that, where Nephi says that, he, he mentioned the same verse, 
many covenants that may taken away many plain and precious parts and many covenants of the Lord. The Christian churches made people beholden to the churches for salvation, not directly to God under the terms of the covenants that God made with his people. And if those covenants were re-understood in terms of emperor vows and covenants, this passage, these passages in Isaiah would make a whole lot more sense. So in a way, you have to go back to the whole covenant theology of the Davidic covenant in the first place, to the Abrahamic covenant and to the Sinai covenant, in order to understand how these covenants work and how this particular passage works within the context of those covenants. Yeah. I, so I think closing thoughts here, maybe if I were to wrap it up and give all of what we've read so far a theme, is that the Lord's covenants that he has made to the house of Israel, going all the way back to, technically to Adam, right? Adam, Enoch, Noah are all made similar promises, but particularly the ones of note here in Isaiah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the promises that are made to them regarding their posterity, being restored, right? Being empowered, being made the head of the nations. These are all fulfilled on the heels of a time of great distress, great opposition, tribulation. But in keeping with the, the principle of death and rebirth, what we see is that as the Lord's people willingly offer themselves a sacrifice to him and continue to humble themselves before him and, and remain faithful to him, that they're empowered to do his work, that he gathers them in and that those who were of the tribe of Joseph, Joseph of Egypt, who is typical of this very pattern, will fulfill their birthright role in gathering them in. So, Yes, well, Hezekiah, for example, went through a horrendous illness within the very context of the Assyrian siege of Jerusalem. And he offered that up. It was a, it was a life and death thing. Only he Isaiah was able to heal him of it after Hezekiah proved loyal and didn't curse God and die and so forth. Now, and, and the servant in the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, which Jesus quotes in 35, 21, he's marred or disfigured physically so no one can recognize. Him. And no, it's not Jesus. It's Jesus speaking there about his servant. And no, it's not Joseph Smith. It's not about the time of Joseph Smith and his tarring and feathering. That could be a type of shadow, but that's about all. No, this is a physical healing which Jesus speaks about in 35, 21. That's also Isaiah speaks of in chapter 57 of Isaiah. So that all of us and Jesus, emanating Jesus, these Messianic individuals, they are going to go through an enormous descent phase of suffering and humiliation in order to be reborn spiritually in the power of God. And the sermon, of course, and the 144,000 sermons will go through this suffering and humiliation. Isaiah says it, chapter 66, read it there. But they come out so empowered that in the end they're all translated and have power over the elements, they have the sealing power, they have power to bring the house of Israel, Jews, Lamanites, and ten tribes to Zion, as Isaiah says in 49, 22, and 23, upon their shoulders and in their, in their arms, even literally, physically, in a moment, to, to bring them to Zion. Yeah. Okay, I think it's beautiful. Avraham, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, go through this with us. We always appreciate your insight, and uh, we'll look forward to tackling chapters, what will it be, chapters uh, in Second Nephi 20 through 24 next week. So, well, thank, thank you, Kevin. Enjoyed it, as always. Thank you very much. We'll see you.